Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from uh, Miami. This is John Quelch, the Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Cobb Leadership Lecture. Uh, the Cobb Lecture is an annual event which uh, is endowed by Ambassador Susan Cobb on behalf of uh, her and in honor of her husband, Ambassador Chuck Cobb, long-serving, distinguished University of Miami trustee. And uh, every year we try to reserve for the Cobb Lecture someone very, very special. And this year we're honored and thrilled to have with us uh, Paula Kerger. Uh, Paula is the president and CEO of PBS. Uh, she has held that position for 15 years, the longest serving in PBS history, and has obviously during that period uh, had to implement considerable change in terms of the way in which uh, PBS uh, is positioned and uh, operates in a very rapidly changing media environment. Um, prior to uh, being with uh, PBS, uh, Paula was uh, uh, with um, the um, uh, Education Broadcasting Corporation, which is the uh, parent company of WNET in New York, the uh, PBS operation there. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly relevant uh, in Paula's background, which includes numerous awards, uh, is the fact that she was the former, she's the former board chairman of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History. Uh, and that, that's a very, very distinguished uh, post to, to have held. So we're, we're thrilled to have Paula with us. Uh, I'm also thrilled tonight uh, to be able to welcome our Dean of the School of Communications at the University of Miami, uh, Karen Wilkins, uh, who's gonna be joining me on the uh, uh, Q&A and doing the interview as well. So Karen, welcome. Would you like to just say a few words? I would, thank you very much. I wanna start by thanking Dean Quelch for inviting me to collaborate on this. We have a lot of wonderful programs that we work on with the Herbert Miami Business School, such as our media management graduate degrees and certificates. And I'm very glad to be part of this because we care a lot about media. We know media matter, particularly public media. New media shape what we know and how we know it and contribute to our ability to do a better job in improving the world around us. And to do that, we need to understand the media industries that we have. And we know that public media offer a credible and independent source of information that is absolutely essential for us to be the informed and engaged citizens we know that we need to be. And that also requires excellence in leadership so we're very thrilled to be able to welcome Paula in that space, but that also gives me an opportunity to say welcome and appreciation for our ambassador Chuck Cobb, who's not only a trustee of the university, but has served our country in his capacity as ambassador to Iceland, which I think is, uh, it, it was interesting is that there are more poets in Iceland per capita than any other country in the world. I also appreciate uh, his wife, Susan Cobb, who has served as ambassador to, to Jamaica, which is a very important partner for the university and its work. So together they valorize the global dynamics that matter so much to the work of the university and to the mission of our communication school. So thank you. Ambassador Cobb. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Karen and Dean John. Um, as, I, as I've told both of you, we are so delighted that uh, that Paula has been selected and has accepted our, our invitation to, to speak on leadership. Um, as, as I think most of your audience knows, we, we've been blessed to have really some of the top leaders in our country uh, in government. We've had uh, Condoleezza Rice and Secretary of Defense Cap Weinberger and Governor Jeb Bush and several other Secretaries of Commerce and others from business. We've had uh, Henry Kravitz and, and Steve Schwartzman and, and the founder of Motorola, uh, uh, forget his name. <laughs> uh, in any event, we've, we've had uh, and four star admirals, both uh, uh, Jim Stravitas uh, and Admiral Fowler. And, and just we, we've just had these really top people. And Paula, 
you're one of them and we're, and we're honored. And, um, and as I think some of, of the, your audience knows that three of your uh, board members are also trustees of the University of Miami. Our chair, Lori Silver, David Bloomberg, and Freddie Behrens. And by the way, they tell us that you're one of the top CEOs in the country, and that's why we're so proud to have you. So look forward to it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ambassador. I think you just uh, miss, misspoke there, and uh, David Weaver, I think, is the uh, the name that... Uh, what did I say? Uh, David Bloomberg. Uh, oh, I'm not excuse quite, me. Uh, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. No, I just wanted, well, I, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we got that one straight, so forgive me. Um, but Paula, thank you so much, and thanks to the Ambassador and to Karen again for joining me. We're going to start just talking a little bit about the media landscape, if we may. Um, it's extremely fragmented, uh, perhaps more so than ever. Uh, there seems to be a saturation of content. Um, I noticed that there are new um, media news organizations popping up almost every week, um, whether it's News Nation or Newsy, uh, et cetera. So what, what do you make of this and how do you how do you position PBS so that it stands out um, amid this cacophony of uh, options? Well, I, I often say that media is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and it, it is certainly, particularly in the last couple of years, become that much more complex. And I think uh, if, you, if you look, uh, particularly over the last couple of years during this period of the pandemic, where you see uh, what I think has been just a rapid acceleration of change in the way that people are consuming media. It is, uh, it is indeed very fragmented. And, um, you know, I, I think for organizations such as mine, um, you know, we're a media organization, we're also a nonprofit organization. So I, I often say that we use the same tools, but we're not quite in the same business. Uh, it's interesting with such a proliferation of media organizations, there also has been a, a collapse of local media. Um, if you look at what's going on in, in newspapers in particular, you see that although there, there appears to be an ever-growing source of information, even in the digital space, a lot of that is, is based on the coast. Actually, Miami has been the recipient of a of a, of a great import of, of a lot of people that are in this space. So I think you're probably well served, but in many parts of the country um, uh, where I travel and visit our local stations, our local public television stations, along with our public radio uh, brethren are often the last remaining locally owned, operated and governed media companies. And I think that has significance. You know, we're, we're local media. Um, uh, when I first took this job, which actually is almost 16 years ago this month, um, it was, uh, people said to me, wow, you're running this big enterprise. And I said, you, you have to understand the structure of public television, which is a little different than anyone else, in that we are, in fact, local first, national second. So PBS itself was formed by all of our stations as a way to create scale and to produce uh, programs on behalf of the collective. So you know, a news hour and a front line and a great performances and, a, and uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, all of that is created uh, uh, by this national organization, which is then distributed out to our stations. But inherently, we're local organizations. They're all independent. They all have their own boards. So they're very deeply anchored in local communities. So it sounds like a long-winded meandering answer to a question about the media landscape, but actually it's at the core of, of what differentiates us from everyone else is what we have this very deep anchor to local community. We're focused on local issues. And then we also have the ability to look across the country and then by extension to look across the world. Our motivation at the end of the day is a service one. And so we were created with this idea that media is not just an entertainment tool, but when it really hits its mark, it, it should also be educational and we really hit our mark inspirational. Um, that's not exactly what you think about if you work at another media organization. And I'm not disparaging other media companies. There's a lot of great work that happens across the industry. It's just the focus is a little different. Mm -hmm. And so if you get up every day thinking about how do we improve the lives of individuals? How do we improve the lives of communities? You make slightly different decisions about what you're going to program, what you're going to um, 
bring in terms of the service that you provide and even what platforms you're using in order to connect out. And that's where I think we've been able to somehow, even in the midst of now all of this noise, continue to be able to find a, a path that is quite different than what everyone else is doing. Uh, so terrific. Uh, let me just raise the issue of social media. And um, that, of course, has in the last decade become so much more important and it essentially competes for our attention with the uh, more traditional uh, broadcast uh, media. Um, obviously, a lot of people are concerned about fake news and uh, misinformation that is perpetrated on social media. How can an organization like uh, PBS uh, stand up to the onslaught of uh, fake news? It almost seems like a David versus Goliath proposition at this point. Well, I, I mean, I think ultimately people want to understand uh, the important issues of the day. And if you look at uh, what I think is, is really one of the greatest issues that we wrestle with as a country, which is trust. You know, who do you trust? Who do you trust in the information that you get? Who do you, who do you trust to, um, to give you, um, you know, those basic facts that help you make just good decisions in your life? And I think that for uh, an organization like ours, that's what we were built on. Um, you know, we are largely supported by philanthropic contributions. We get a very small percentage of our money from the federal government that's largely to, to fund the infrastructure for public broadcasting, particularly in stations that serve rural communities. So the federal corporation doesn't come to PBS, it goes to your local station. And it's mostly to help them, uh, particularly, um, you know, we have, a, we have a, a station in Cookville, Tennessee, which serves, serves a portion of Appalachia. You know, 60% of their revenue comes from the federal government. My old station in New York, it was something like six. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the, the idea is that, you know, this is a public private partnership in the areas where we can raise money. That's, that's what we do. Um, why do people give money to organizations? They trust them. Why do your alumni give you money? Because they had this extraordinary experience and they trust that um, University of Miami was formative, not only for them, but they hope for their kids and for their community. And so I think part of it is in, in just the, the structure of, of who we are. So we're a very trusted organization and we take that to heart. We make decisions in a way that, um, that we believe just engenders more trust and that's, it becomes just this beautiful virtuous circle. And I think that um, when I talk to people, by the way, of all political backgrounds and interests, a lot of people come to us. Viewership in the news hour has gone up significantly because people just want the information. They don't want to be told how to thought, how to, how to think about issues. They just want information and then they can make up their own minds. And that's really what we have tried to do. And I think even in social media, and we have a space in social media, by the way. So part of, of what we um, attempt to do as, as an organization is not just operate as a broadcaster in the, in, the, in the areas of media that we've always operated on. We try to meet people where they are. And we believe that the brand of PBS, the brand of our stations is very powerful. And if we can distribute content on those, uh, on those platforms as well, that is a great way to extend our reach. But I think the the larger question around what to do around uh, lack of trust in information and what to do about um, you know, belief in the validity of news, I think it's up to everyone that is working in this space, and particularly this is something that we take to heart, is to look at ways to operate in as transparent a way as possible. I'll give you one example. Our investigative journalism series Frontline, which I would argue is uh, is, uh, is one of the most important series, not just on public television, but on all of television, deeply committed to bringing forward the most important issues of our time, not the latest Kardashian story. And um, in their work, uh, which has always been used by our government, by opinion leaders across the country, as well as, uh, as uh, the public, in trying to get information about the, the um, uh, about various issues. Um, it's, a, it's in a documentary form. And what uh, Rainey Aronson, who is executive producer, has done 
is um, is in addition to publishing the documentary that you can watch on public broadcasting or stream on one of the platforms of your choice, she also posts all interviews. So as part of a real effort of transparency, so that you know so much so much in storytelling is not only about the information itself, but it's what you choose to include. You ask whatever questions you ask. And then as an editor, you, you put the story arc together. And by including um, the, um, the full interviews themselves, if you're interested in going back and trying to drill down and understand, you can see it all. It's all out there for, for you to look at. That's just one little example. I think other issues um, that, you know, that we have tried to tackle and which I know that your organization has as well as, is around just media literacy is the real effort to help all of us understand how to identify trusted sources of information and evaluate the veracity of what you're reading and seeing and hearing. And I think that's, that's a shared obligation that, that you as an academic organization and we as public media, I think really take to heart. When, when I think of uh, public broadcasting, of course, uh, coming from the UK, I think of the BBC and uh, local BBC radio and uh, television efforts. How, how does the PBS system in the US compare in your view to public broadcasting organizations in other countries? Yeah, we're part of a community of public broadcasters. Actually, we're an active member in association of all the public broadcasters. Um, it was the BBC that was the great inspiration for the creation of PBS, as a matter of fact. So, so we're a little different. I'll give you a, a very quick history lesson, not for you personally, Dean, for everyone that's listening in. But um, in, the, in the UK, the BBC came first. The idea was, you know, the uh, media is a public service. We're a little different on the other side of the pond. We started out as a capitalist system. Uh, commercial television came first, and it was really the first woman FCC commissioner, a woman by the name of Frida Hennick, who had this idea as she watched this emerging tech, then emerging technology, and also, of course, looked at radio and thought, you know, if, if a portion of the spectrum is not set aside for pure educational purposes, she worried that the, that the potential of the media wouldn't be fully realized. She looked at what was happening in commercial television and she saw some good and some um, areas that clearly the marketplace would not necessarily pick up. And so she lobbied to have a percentage of broadcast spectrum set aside for educational purposes. And that's actually how we started. There was no money, by the way. It was just there was spectrum. You could put in an application to, uh, to get a license for a public television station. The very first public television station was University of Houston. And they had, I believe at the time, a communications school. And they thought that this was a, an interesting um, application for their school. And some of the earliest stations were part of universities. Some states then decided that um, having uh, television licenses would allow them to become classrooms of the air. If you look at many of the station call letters and public television, a lot of them have E's in their name. That's because it was originally educational television. And then um, it was Lyndon, jo but these were all independent stations, by the way, and they all had their own broadcast schedules and their own ideas of what service meant in communities. Um, but then Lyndon Johnson looked at the BBC and thought, this is something that our country should have, something that really reflected our culture, that, uh, that had the ability to um, you know, sort of uplift the citizenry. And he signed the Public Broadcasting Act um, a, more, a little more than 50 years ago with the idea that we would form an entity, PBS, which would become that central place where resources could come together on behalf of all of our stations. And that enabled us to, to start out the news hour, as I said before, and to invest in a, in a very tall yellow bird um, um, that started Sesame Street and some other programs. And so it all sort of spun up from then. But the, but the idea here, which is different than the BBC and, and most of the other public broadcasters is most of them are, are largely government funded. And we were always created with this idea that it would be this public-private partnership. And there are many times, I will tell you, that I have thought if I had the resources of a BBC, 
and uh, you know that it would be extraordinary. But on the other hand, I do think that this idea that does feel very American of volunteerism, by the way, many of our stations were started by women. And what caused that? Sesame Street. So Sesame Street actually predates PBS. And people heard about this extraordinary program for kids and wanted to get it for their own communities. And in fact, um, and this may sound apocryphal, it is absolutely true. Uh, I met women that did bake sales and that did all kinds of fundraising activities to, to, to help stations come to life across the country. And so I, I think now as you look forward, and I can't even remember now what, what question you asked because you were asking me about the BBC, but I'm, I'm, I'll knit it together, I promise, and then I'll stop talking. But I think that um, ultimately this public television system that did start out you know, very scrappy, very entrepreneurial, and very much rooted in community, I think serves our country very well. And I think especially now. And again, as I said, from the very beginning, when you were asking me about all these various media players and how do you compete, this idea that we are in fact rooted in community is very powerful. Now that's not to say that we're not partnering with a number of organizations. We have relationships with Netflix and Amazon and others. Uh, we have our app that, um, that streams content. Uh, we have a place on YouTube TV. So we are very much rooted in our legacy, but we are very much rooted in this idea that we have to continue to be entrepreneurial and to think about the audience first and to make sure that in our um, objectives of fulfilling our mission, that we are very much focused on service and whatever that means. And, and tying that to making sure that we're in those places where people are looking for information is I think the, the heart of, of what we have tried to advance as we look at PBS for the future. Terrific, so let, let me hand over to Karen at this point. Oh, thank you. And happy International Women's Day one day later. I'm very glad that you brought up the importance of women in leadership. I think that's great. Um, so Dean Quelch's questions had a lot to do with the programs and your answers are very helpful in helping us understand the role of PBS as service. And I think it's very interesting and important, the structure that you laid out, the importance of local community. And I'll also add that things like Sesame Street that then are replicated all over the world. I mean, that's one of the right. things that I'm so impressed with is the connection with local community, but then partners all over. Um, so in terms of community, you talked about the trust that we do have with local news and with public media. In thinking about PBS as an important part of our community, um, how are you able to you know, work with communities in terms of addressing contemporary social concerns, whether it's social racial justice or climate change or other issues that are important to local communities? How can you help PBS be, do that work? So, um... It's a, it's a great question. And again, it is one that I think we're very well suited to do because what we, um, I think are able to contribute to communities is a public square. Mm -hmm. We bring, um, because we, we do have a, a very large audience that cuts across all ages and all socioeconomic uh, levels and all different backgrounds and frankly, um, all different political ideas. Uh, we, we are a space that where people come. And I think that's important. Um, I think the, the other thing is that we have been focused on storytelling for the last 50, 60 years that are all focused on the roots of all of the issues that you just described. So mm -hmm. science and natural history is, uh, is, is a deep um, uh, uh, scope of work that we've been engaged in for many, many years through series like Nova and Nature and, and the original National Geographic series. And, and we are very much interested in helping everyone understand this, uh, this planet that we all inherit and our responsibility to it. And so that is, is very much a, a core of, of what we bring forward. In the last two years, um, you know, our, our 50th anniversary 
uh, fell right in the middle of COVID. Actually, the end of the first year of COVID was was our 50th anniversary, and we had thought we were going to, you know, celebrate it in a, in a in a different way. You know, we thought that we would, you know, do tributes to some of the people that have been on public broadcasting in the past, the Julia Childs and the Carl Sagan's, and you know, the Alistair Cook and all that. We did a tiny bit of that. But actually what we really did is we took everything that we'd learned over the prior 50 years and we put it to use in, uh, on behalf of the public. Within, uh, within weeks of schools closing down, we had already stood up um, uh, on broadcast an educational television service. We run a broadband service we have now for a number of years of educational content that we produce directly for teachers, which we offer free of charge. It's used by about a million teachers a month. Within two weeks, it had jumped to four million. And um, you know, and to be able to lean in at that moment was important. When George Floyd died, and suddenly um, it felt like the whole country was really trying to understand this place that we sit in, we were able to not only bring forward new films. But we had a very deep library of programming that we had built over the years that really talked about the heart of how we got to this point where we are now. Because I think the part of understanding the, the solutions for the future is to understand what brought us here. And so I think that, you know, for us in this, in this time of which um, there are such serious issues for us to grapple with to um, continue to focus, and, and we were talking just for a few minutes before we got onto this call about the larger question about civil society and democracy. Right. This is a big area of um, a focus for us now and for the years moving forward. In 2025, Ken Burns is doing a major series on the Revolutionary War. And beginning, beginning several years ago, we started thinking about that broadcast and about using that as an anchor point as we talk about our democracy, both what was envisioned at its founding, as well as how we have fared over the years and have thought about how we could use the event of a big broadcast moment like that to facilitate conversations at, at universities, at historical societies, at places around the country to bring people together to talk about this extraordinary experience and experiment of the United States and what does it mean? As Ken Burns always likes to say that bridge between lowercase u, lowercase s to capital U, capital S. And I think, so I think to answer your question, what the role of public broadcasting, again, is not to come forward with the answers to all of the thorny questions we have, but to bring forward in, in a powerful way of storytelling that I think media enables the, the, the background, the context, the issues, and frankly, the safe space so that people can come together and have conversations. Many of our stations then um, will look at some of these big ideas. They'll have convenings locally. They may do local programs and then just drill down deeper. But I think that's the role of media. In a, in a moment like this is, is, to, um, is to create that opportunity for, for people to, to come together. I've got one more question before I turn this back over to John. You, you talked about news literacy and the kinds of education that, that we are developing in our school and that we need to develop to enable people, as you said, to know what questions to ask and to think for themselves about what they discern through the media. Do you have any suggestions? You've obviously given this a lot of thought about what you think would be helpful in creating a news literacy or a media literacy program. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I, I think we should start with, um, with um, our youngest citizens, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think just, um, I, 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 I speak on a lot of college campuses. I haven't done as much in the last couple of years because I haven't been traveling as much, but even through Zooms, I've talked to, to, um, you know, to students, students are pursuing, I know this is business school, but are pursuing liberal arts degrees. And, you know, the, the idea of critical thinking and all of those skills that one develops when one is, um, is in a, in a, a liber, liberal arts program, and, and certainly is the case in, in, in business school and also um, in communication school, 
is to um, is that there's there there are skills that we need to develop that we need to help um, our youngest develop to discern the the sources of information to help them really analyze what what um, what is being said to recognize that you know there may be facts coming from different places and and how to really sort that out. I think one of the the great challenges that all of us will need to wrestle with and why this has become so complex is in this era of, um, of digital and particularly of social media, where information is being, um, is being delivered to us largely through algorithms. I think most people don't realize um, that the information that I receive is different than the information that you receive all based on language all based on what, what sites that we may have visited before. And so it would be very easy, un, unlike the days when we were all watching Walter Concrete, Walter Cronkite around that electronic hearth, we were all hearing the same thing at the same time. That is not the case now. And so I think that there is a role for um, larger society to really wrestle with this challenge of the fact that, that um, we are not all getting the same information and that there is a, a true lack of understanding that um, of, of what is going on. Look, you know, if you, if you subscribe to Netflix, you know that your Netflix feed looks different than mine and it's all based on what I've clicked on, what I've liked. And I think that, um, I mean, even taking this further out, I, I grew up on AM radio and I listened to a whole range of music. And if you're listening to Spotify, you get fed the same stuff that you like um, and with maybe slight iterations around it, but it doesn't capture the full spectrum of what it is to appreciate a much wider range of perspectives. And I think that that is something, I know that there are academic organizations, I know MIT, for example, through their media lab is really wrestling with these questions. Some of our producers have been looking quite hard at how our work is exhibited and who was watching on broadcast, who was watching on digital, um, and how those audiences may be a little different. Again, based on the on the fact of the of of where an algorithm may be may be pushing content. So I think that it's a very complex question, Karen, and it's not just a, ma a matter of t having people understand how to read something and and be able to you know, evaluate the, the truthfulness of it, but also how we're actually getting that information delivered to us. I don't really have all the answers to this, but I, I believe that academic organizations, media organizations, and policymakers coming together can help sort some of this out so that we can begin to wrestle with it. Because I think that it sits at the root of, of frankly, a lot of issues that, um, that not solved, but could be um, uh, partially um, uh, worked through if we were able to really come together in, in, a, in, a, in a way where we're looking at information and a certain base of, of commonly accepted facts. Uh, so I would like to uh, turn to a few questions on leadership, particularly because this is the Cobb Leadership Lecture. And I first want to ask you, Paula, regarding leadership among journalists, uh, among media people in America. Um, I remember the famous moment when uh, President Johnson uh, said, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost America. Yes. Do we have a Walter Cronkite today? And if we don't have a Walter Cronkite today, would America be better off if there was one? Well, it's... It's, um, you know, again, given the fact that um, media is profoundly different than at a time when there were basically three networks and, and uh, PBS and maybe an independent station or two, um, it's, it is hard to imagine how you create that mass and sort of collective experience that um, that someone like a Walter Cronkite spoke to. That's not to say that it isn't important to have powerful um, uh, figures that represent that kind of, of, um, of um, 
you know, authority in terms of the information that they're conveying. But I think the landscape is just so profoundly different that it's hard to think of a single person like that standing out. I, th I think the bigger issue is, is, is what I described before. I think that, you know, everything has become so um, uh, broken down into smaller and smaller component pieces. And so, you know, you look at the audience of, of even, I was just reading some articles this week that talks about the, the scale of the audience that, um, you know, the number of people who are actually tweeting, relatively small. The number of people who are, are uh, watching some of the news programs that seem to get then played and replayed across, I mean, it's still relatively small. It's not the country sort of came together around Walter Cronkite at night or certainly around the three networks at night. Um, having said all of that, I, I, I do believe that there, there needs to be, and, there, and I think there is a strong argument for that kind of reasoned voice um, and, and that's what I, I hope that the journalists on PBS is in a, a PBS commercial, but it's the thing mm -hmm. that I'm the proudest of. Um, you know, Judy Woodruff is an extraordinary mm -hmm. journalist. And um, I know how difficult it is to be a journalist right now and to, to be covering the news. Um, but she tackles it each and every day, not only as the um, anchor of the, of the news hour, but also as the managing editor with the same commitment to the principles that, um, you know, that her predecessor and in, in Jim, Jim Lehrer used to talk about in, in his principles of journalism, including the fact that we're not in the entertainment business, that you wanna cover a story in the way that you hope someone would write a story about you. And, and the fact that, um, you know, that the attention has to be on the, on the facts themselves, that you have to, to make a clear distinction between uh, news reporting and point of view, um, and, uh, and and these are all areas where I think there's been um, I think there's been challenge in the last years, and so I'm I'm proud of the work that that we do, and I'm proud of the work that that team does, and that struggles to do each and every day to ensure the integrity of that broadcast. If uh, the media is more fragmented. Uh, reflecting perhaps that society as a whole is more fragmented, is it more difficult to lead an organization today than it was 15 years ago? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, in the last years, for sure, in the last two years, for sure, uh, you know, leading an organization during this period has been uh, profoundly difficult. And, uh, you know, there's no playbook for what we've been working through over the last couple of years. And I think looking at this from a, from a business school perspective, I have, um, I've, I've been doing some work with UVA with the Darden School. And, you know, the, the number of conversations that I've been in in the last six months in particular of what the shape of, of work will be like looking out over the next um, you know, uh, years, but certainly even looking out over the next year as so many organizations are trying to figure out uh, based on the needs of the organization, but also the expectations of their employees of um, you know, of, of what, it, what is a workplace? You know, I, you know, there are, there are CEOs that very early on said, oh, we're going to be fully virtual companies. And there are others that have gone the other extreme and said, no, we're going to have everyone in the office every day. And it's going to be like it, it was, I think for most companies, it's going to be somewhere in between. I think that figuring out, um, you know, the workplace, not just as a place where you, you come and you put in time, but it's how do you think about the workplace as a tool? From an employer standpoint, uh, particularly in some of the areas that um, in fields that are highly competitive now, you know, programmers and coders and people that are working in 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 building digital games, all of the, all of, of that part of our work, you know, for me to have a a national or frankly, you know, potentially a global marketplace to compete for talent is appealing. Um, but I also am trying to balance that out with the, the ability to have people to get physically together. You know, we're social animals. I think we do the best when we are able to collaborate, um, as, you know, face to face. So figuring out what all that looks like, I think, is going to be, you know, profoundly different, difficult. 
But on the other hand, if we're not afraid, and the thing that's been interesting in these last two years is we've done a lot of stuff we never thought we'd do. You know, did you, would you have thought we would have done the Cobb lecture virtually? No, you would have, you know, we would have been sitting on a stage side by side and we would have, it would have been limited to the number of people who were in that auditorium. And here we are scattered from wherever, you're mostly, I guess, in Miami, I'm, I'm in Virginia. And uh, I bet the audience is significantly bigger and you've taped it and you're probably gonna do other things with it. So the fact that we've had to do all these work runs, Judy Woodruff did the news hour for many nights out of, the, out of her library at her home. You know, who would have thought we would have tried that? I taped an interview for CBS Sunday morning. This was our great anniversary show that they did. I taped it off of my iPhone. By the way, when you tape for broadcast using your iPhone, you do it this way. You don't do it the selfie way because the camera's better this side. I can tell you how to do it. They sent me instructions on how to, how to set up my camera. They, they sent me instructions. I thought they'd send me like a, a tripod or special lighting or everything. They, they sent me instructions on how to convert a Kleenex box into a tripod. That's what I used. My phone was shoved into a Kleenex box, the boutique size, by the way. And, you know, it looked pretty damn good. Go look online at the CBS Sunday morning profile of the 50th anniversary of PBS. You'll see my interview. It was done off of my cell phone. So, I mean, for me, this feels, you know, this feels crazy, but it also feels like uh, a moment when, you know, the one thing that I think for organizations that have, have existed for a while and that have a great brand, you know, you never want to mess up the brand and it sometimes limits you in what you're willing to try. And I think what this period has done is it has shown us that, yeah, we can, we can do things that we thought were just not possible. And I think if we can carry a bit of that entrepreneurial spirit forward post this period, you know, we will have, um, I think, taken what has been a, a very difficult time and really converted it into something that, you know, when we look back, uh, will be one of those sort of nodal moments for our organizations. But look at, um, look at what's happening at universities. Look at the number of university presidents that have stepped down in the last year or so. Look at the number in our system, in our public television system, in the last two years since we've had a big annual meeting and brought our stations together, we have out of, a, out of 179 separate stations, 55 new general managers. And you, know, you see that in, in corporate America, you see the number of people that have decided, you know, this is complicated. And so I think this is a, this is a profoundly difficult time. And then you know, in, the, in the category of leadership, you know, the organization that I've described is a federated system. So our stations all bear the name of PBS, I have a lot of responsibility, but not always ultimate authority of all the decisions they make. And so in, in, a, in a time of enormous change, when there are some that still hope that we can go back to the days of three stations and good old Walter Cronkite, this is a time when you have to be willing to lean forward and do some truly scary things, such as understand that not all the programming from your station is going to come from your transmitter. It may be sitting on Netflix or YouTube or on a Roku or any of those places and being getting everyone to agree that these are avenues that we have to pursue is, uh, is, is an interesting leadership challenge. But I think that the more that you can tap into this idea of we're in this together, this is a sense of common purpose, which by the way is what carried us through the last two years. Um, I think that's how you can actually make change, even at times when it feels like you are way out of your comfort zone. That's a related question. How do you evaluate your own success as a leader? Well, um, that's a, a good question. So uh, I'll look, I, I, we spend a lot of time, we're a metrics driven organizations. So we spend a lot of time really wrestling with the ultimate question of, you know, what does success look like? And so if I was running a commercial organization, it'd be pretty easy. And, and you, I could get, gauge my own leadership success. So it's, it's how many eyeballs and how much revenue. I mean, that would be, and if I, you know, if those numbers were pretty good, then I think I'd be a pretty good leader. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit glib here, but I know that there's a lot more to it than that. But, but those, are, those are pretty clear benchmarks for us. 
we obviously are running, a, we're running a business. We're, I was just talking to someone earlier in the week and um, who said to me, you know, I've just been thinking about you and, you know, most nonprofits compete against other nonprofits. You're actually competing in one of the most um, uh, uh, complicated industries mm -hmm. and your competition is not other nonprofit organizations, your competition is, is, are people that have a lot more money than you do. And so, um, I do care about audience because we're mass media. I mean, if we're creating content and we're watched by five people, I'm not sure that we've actually hit our mission, mm -hmm. but it's it's a little different. And so ultimately I'm gonna make a decision on, on a program, not because it's gonna bring in the biggest audience of all time, but because it's gonna serve a purpose. It may be about a subject that's not well explored or it may maybe in an area that um, that where we were just talking about climate change, where, you know, it will be very important for us to have a, a deeper understanding of the of the real issues. So I, I, I look at ratings, we sort of, you know, we, we keep it in perspective. So, you know, we're not completely oblivious, but it's not driving it. We look at, um, at, at where we're building audience. So we look at who's watching. I'm very interested. We have a very large older audience. We have a very young, large young audience, uh, not as big in between. So how we're developing and bringing in new audiences, that's important. I wanna reflect the diversity of our country in the audiences that we bring in as well as the programming. I look at, as a proxy for quality, I look at awards. So I, I, I'm proud of the fact that we won, we win more news and documentary awards, more Peabody's than anybody that matters. Um, I also um, look for any other evidence of impact. And, um, and, and then I go through my own process with our board and, and looking at the management team. And I, I want feedback on my own performance, you know, is, is, Am I, am I helping advance the organization or am I in areas impeding that? And I think that's, it's important to be self-aware and it's important, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, this job is not about me, it's about the organization. And so I, I look at if our organization advances and thrives, if we have people within it who are excited to come to work, um, I feel like I've, I've, I've done my part. My job, I think oftentimes is to clear the brush and to make sure that, the, that I hire the very best people and that they're able to do their very best work. And ultimately, if that's the case, then I think I've done, I've, I've done okay as a leader. I'll hand back to uh, Karen for a couple more questions. Thank you. I'm actually gonna bring some of the questions about the future together. So we have a little bit more time for, for other people's questions. We've talked about how historically we've gone from, at least in news, having a very prominent voice of Walter Cronkite to over time being more fragmented with different levels of credibility and voices, but also more diversity of voices. When you're thinking about the future, in the service that PBS provides, which is so important. How do you see us moving forward? What are, what are you um, planning for PBS for say the next decade or two in terms of this as a public media service, but then also in terms of impact on our American society? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm focused on a couple of things. Uh, one is, um, you know, people always ask about you know, the future of media and how we see ourselves evolving. And I, I can talk um, about the work that we have had. We've actually been underway for some period of time, which is looking at, you know, PBS as a, as a broadcast organization, but also the, the many different ways that people are consuming content and making sure that we're in those places. Uh, looking at partnerships we develop and so forth, which, by the way, I think is is profoundly important. I, I think you know, and I think many companies look at this as well. You don't have to do it all. You look at those alignments, and actually, it's really interesting now what's going on with the streamers who are, you know, coming together in all kinds of different configurations. So I think there's a there's a big piece of that that's that is important. I think, however, the most important piece is is not what is the new and the next, but it is what is the, the um, North Star that you need to fiercely hold on to. Those attributes of the work of public broadcasting that have defined it, 
that um, that could easily be lost if not carefully nurtured. And so what do I mean? I, you know, we're storytellers. So that is the through line that began when we began 50, 60 years ago and carries all the way through, but storytellers around content that matters. I sometimes will call it content of consequence, content that has impact. And so um, I think if, if I was to look out over you know, three to five years, which is the usual horizon for our strategic plan, it's, it's hard to look for me to look out 10 years because if you just look, look back five years, I look back to when I started at PBS 16 years ago, there was, you know, Netflix, you got the, you know, the dicks, discs in the mail, um, you know, um, all of the different ways that, you know, most people are consuming media were not existent. My very first speech in public broadcasting, I talked about Apple selling episodes of Desperate Housewives for $1.99 on iTunes, which just seemed like the, weird, who, who would pay $1.99 for an episode of Desperate Housewives? I mean, but I mean, it just, it, but it was the bellwether. It was the beginning of what was clearly a, a sea change in the way that people were going to consume media. And, um, you know, so as you look forward, what is that, you know, what does that next turn look like? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, you know, we're experimenting in things like virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, some of our storytellers have, have done really great work in those kind of videos, maybe, but the undercurrent of all of it is it's, 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 it's storytelling and, um, and, but making sure that those, those stories that we're pushing forward and in whatever, whatever format they're built in, actually make a difference in people's lives. That is the thing that we have to continue to wrestle with and figure out. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't like to describe public television in a, in a negative way, but so much of what we do um, from the very beginning was looking at what everyone else is doing in the media and thinking about what's missing. You know, so it's not to describe us as in, in the negative of like filling the gaps, but that actually has been a big piece of, of who we are and what we are. You mm -hmm. know, we're, we're, we've been thinking a lot about this moment in the arts. Um, you know, many arts organizations are just trying to get themselves pulled back together again. Most of, of the arts programming that's available on television is, are the competition shows. And I, I just think that there is so much that is going on around the country that deserves to be captured and showcased and brought forward. And as we're looking at, at lots of different media forms for that, it could be quite powerful. Um, so again, just constantly thinking about what's missing and how can we help bring that to the public and why does it matter it, it's it's uplifting at a time when i think we need to be uplifted it 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 offers hope and possibility and inspiration it builds the audience for these organizations and frankly for young kids i grew up in a in a relatively rural area my first experience in the arts was watching on public television so i know what it meant to me and i'm not an artist and i'm not a dancer which is the thing that i really love but it kindled in me a lifelong passion. And that's what, and that doesn't change. That just continues. And so making sure that we are paying attention to that and bringing that forward, that's where I think public broadcasting will be for the future. Uh, so uh, Paula, we're down to the last five minutes and I want to sneak in some audience questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you three questions that our audience has raised. And uh, it's, it's what I think in, uh, popular news journalism is called the lightning round. Um, so one question is, how are local station initiated production ideas funded? Uh, how does the central organization work with the local station to develop, nurture, and execute, implement an idea? The so, second, the yeah. se let, let me you ask all the break. questions, yeah. I'll ask the second, the second one, could you tell us, because you haven't told us about one of your great initiatives around learning media for kids, and could you tell us how that came about and how it was implemented? And then the third question, um, which is a slightly more controversial one, is PBS is classified by a certain number of people as, quote, liberal media. How do you make sure that that perception is overcome among the perhaps large swath of uh, American citizens who have that view. So um, 
Uh, I'll do it in reverse order. So it is actually not a large swath of American citizens that view us as liberal. Um, I, you know, we work very hard to bring many points of view forward. And we actually look very carefully at the audiences, particularly around news programs, uh, because that's where I think oftentimes that label of liberal is, is tied to our news reporting or so forth. And I can tell you that the people that are watching NewsHour, the people that are watching Frontline come from all different uh, cross sections of the political landscape. But obviously we look at it very carefully. We wanna make sure that we're not contributing to the problem I was talking about a few minutes ago of, of creating an echo right. chamber. We wanna bring lots of perspectives forward. Learning Media was a, was a project that we created. I made reference to it much earlier. I just didn't call it by name. It's a broadband service that has um, assets, educational assets that are tied to the core um, curriculum. It's K-12, it's around different uh, content areas. Some of it uh, comes off of public television uh, content. Some of it is relationships with organizations like Smithsonian, National Archives, NASA, and so forth. And it brings that material into the classroom. And it's the, it's the service I talked about when I was talking about COVID. We, we had a million users a month. We jumped up to 4 million during the time when most kids were home. And now we're at a couple million uh, teachers a, a month are using the service. And it's, uh, it's an important piece of what we do. And then the first question was about local stations. And um, our much of our content comes to us from our local stations. And sometimes it comes to us, the local station puts funding into a project, brings it to us. Our, our biggest local stations that contribute to our, our pipeline is WGBH in Boston, WETA in Washington, WNET, my old station in New York. But we get programming from a lot of different stations. I just was working with uh, with the station manager from Arkansas that's bringing us a series on Southern literature. So, um, you know, sometimes we put some money into projects. There isn't one path. And that's one of the things that's complicated about public broadcasting in this disaggregated system is that there are many different ways that programs do come into us uh, from stations. And um, if, if people have ideas about projects they want to advance, I would start with your local station. You can also go on the PBS site and it has information. We, there are organizations that work with independent producers directly. There's just lots of different ways to bring programming forward. But the most of the programming that comes into us comes up from our stations. Uh, this has been a terrific uh, hour. Uh, I think I take away three words, uh, trust, storytelling, and inspiration. I think the word entertainment was actually never used once in the entire in the entire hour. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have you uh, serve the nation for the last 15 years in this position, Paul. Thank you so much. Karen, a few comments and then Ambassador Cobb. I very much appreciate your attention to uh, communication literacy and informed citizens and the integrity of the media. Thank you. Thanks. Ambassador. PBS is a, an important national asset and it's very well led, which is evidenced by today's presentation. Thank you very much for sharing with it. Thank you, Ambassador. Paula, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. A very good evening from Miami. Thank you.